Vull fer la presentació de la nostra primera ponent, la senyora Eva Jolí, que té una llarga experiència com a jutgessa instructora en temps passats, que va ser molt representativa per una de les primeres causes contra la corrupció en l'àmbit europeu, quan moltes vegades aquí no ens plantejàvem ni l'existència mateixa de la corrupció en aspectes. Saber donar el primer pas és important. Jo crec que la nostra ponent, la senyora Jolí, va fer aquest dintre del que és i va descobrir tot allò que eren les llargues ombres i connexions amb la vida econòmica i financera, en aquest cas, i política, en aquest cas es referia a la República Francesa, però jo crec que això és traslladable perfectament a l'actual, al nostre país també. La seva trajectòria com a professional ha estat una professional que de manera contínua, el que diem nosaltres de pedra picada, amb un àmbit de treball diari, amb la seva feina d'investigacions amb rigor i coratge. La lluita contra la corrupció, que ha estat sempre el seu fil conductor. Més enllà de la carrera judicial, ha estat assessora del govern de Noruega, d'on sembla que vostè és originària, i les millors maneres d'establir frens va descobrir, vam descobrir, hem descobert tots els que lluitem d'alguna manera contra la corrupció, que a part de les funcions reactives ha d'haver les funcions preventives, que són molt més efectives a llarg termini, poder no siguin tan visibles com aquells casos que demanen l'actualitat de cada dia, però en realitat són molt més efectives amb aquesta lluita. El seu compromís en l'actualitat s'ha traslladat ja des de fa anys a una òrbita política veritablement important. Fou candidata dels Verds a les presidencials franceses i el dia d'avui és eurodiputada al Parlament Europeu, promotora d'una proposta de directiva per protegir els alertadors. Ens consta que ha fet mans i mànigues per estar com nosaltres, perquè ella tenia i segurament s'haurà de marxar més ràpidament del que nosaltres voldríem, però que en tot cas li agraïm molt que sigui amb nosaltres. Permeti'm que faci una referència, perquè per nosaltres ha estat sempre important, fins i tot el títol, que avui és molt oportú, del seu llibre, de les seves publicacions, entre elles una en particular, que és el que traduint seria Els herois ordinaris, un llibre d'esperança. I, en definitiva, crec que solament explicant aquest títol ens adonem que efectivament aquí tenim una persona molt adequada, molt oportuna per la seva ponència de vida. Madame Jolí, si vostè voleu... D'abord, merci beaucoup à Miguel Angel Jimeno Gibero pour l'invitation. Il est le successeur de David Martinez qui euh, succombait, je crois, d'une crise cardiaque au retour d'une conférence anticorruption. Et c'est avec grand plaisir que j'ai accepté cette invitation car euh, le sujet me tient à cœur et la lecture des journaux en ce qui concerne la situation de la corruption en Espagne était telle que je me suis dit qu'un procureur qui s'engage, qui a envie de protéger les whistleblowers et de combattre la corruption, mais ça mérite vraiment euh, soutien. Hier, il y avait une conférence euh, en France des procureurs, une association qui réunit à peu près tous les procureurs français, et ils crient la misère. Ils disent que la justice française n'est plus en état de rendre une justice équitable, dans des délais raisonnables, tout simplement parce que nous sommes trop pauvres. Et lorsque je regarde le chiffre, vous, vous êtes encore incroyablement plus pauvre. L'Espagne ne consacre que 0,9% de son budget à la justice. Vous êtes le mauvais élève de l'Europe. Ok. 
Okay. Well, I will switch to another language then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry because um, I thought that maybe among you, you understand better French than you understand English, but translation is only provided in English. So I started over again. I'm, I said I was very happy to be here because I know how much Spain is uh, struggling with the, the corruption problem. It is, not only, it is not only a problem for the prosecutor, it's a state problem in Spain. And you have not waited for me to know that. Uh, but we need a judiciary that can work because I believe that the most important factor for how widespread the corruption is here is impunity. And I wrote a book in um, 93 that in Spanish is called Impunidad. It has a preface, it has an introduction by Baltasar Garzon, who wrote 30 pages because he likes to explain. And um, we were very good friends at that time uh, and uh, uh, so I think this book and this title shows what it's all about. It's not that much about text, about that the laws are not well enough written. That has been taken care of the last 30 years through the UN, the UN Convention Against Corruption, and also through uh, the FATF, uh, all these conventions have been signed by Spain and they have audited, they have monitored uh, the laws. That is not the problem. The problem is to implement them and it is the political will. Uh, so in order to be able to implement the laws, you need a well-functioning judiciary. And the first um, requirement to have a well-functioning judiciary is that it has a budget. And Spain has one of the lowest in Europe. Only 0.9% of your, of your budget is allocated to the justice system. And this covers also prisons and so this, this is the first thing to deal with. The first thing that the political forces should require is to have a decent budget, to have judges, to have prosecutors in enough number. Uh, in France yesterday, there was a conference of prosecutors. It is head by Marc Simamonti that you could invite. And uh, he's says that in France, uh, the system has broken down. We are not able anymore to carry on heavy cases in, in decent time and to respect the uh, uh, international obligations because they are too poor. And I think this is something that we must not forget here too. You must do with what you have. And even within this frame, a lot can be done. Uh, but when you see, when I say that it is, not, it is not a question of laws, if you look to the Panama Papers scandal, this shows us that in spite of all the anti-money laundering directives and laws that you have. Trillions of euros left Europe, left Spain and left France and the other countries to go to tax havens through Panama and through one legal firm, Mosec Fonseca, and what we see from here was that these 
documents that were published by investigative journalists, thanks to a whistleblower that we don't know because he managed to stay anonymous, and I'm happy for him. Uh, we know, no, this, this is on the table, that the enforcement of the anti monetary laws in Europe do not work. It is not because we don't have laws. It is because they are being contourned. They are being uh, uh, not respected. And people are able to send these secret money flows out of the country because they get help. And we know from uh, these papers, who are the helpers? Those without uh, the help, nothing would happen. And who are they? They are law firms and they are bankers. We have the name of the bankers and we have the name of the law firms. We do not need much more material. It is there on the table. And this is work for the prosecutors to go after not only the account holders, but also the facilitators. I do really believe that the day when those who advise these schemas, when they will be judged, as accomplice, helper and a bidder for the tax fraud and for helping laundering corruption money, then the world will change because they have benefited of total impunity during all these years. This is an ongoing, very lucrative business and it is not true that this is an accident. It is a business, and we have to understand that. It is a business model, even. And some of the European states are specialized in laundering money. Uh, Malta is one of them. Uh, Malta was headed by a prime minister whose wife got money from Azerbaijan, I think it was, and uh, the whole political elite are involved. There are no inquiries going on, but that didn't stop Malta from having, being the, having the presidency of the European Union until three days ago. And do you believe that uh, the uh, transparency issue, the new obligations for multinationals or individuals, do you think that this agenda did move much forward under uh, this presidency, the Maltese presidency? No, it didn't. They did abstract it very efficiently. This, everything is linked, because your corrupt people that are in your major political party, especially, they do not keep their money either in Spain. They are using these ways of hiding it away from tax authorities, and they do hope also away from Miguel Angel Gmail's inquiries. So you see, this is, it, this is also linked to the system. The European Union, when the Panama Papers scandal broke, we did set up, um, we did what we could do. A parliament can have a special inquiry committee 
and we did set up this committee. I'm the vice chair of it, and we tried to understand how this was possible. Uh, and we, we want to know which are the countries that do not respect the anti-money laundering obligations. What you see is that banks and uh, the other obliged entities are spending a lot of um, efforts to, uh, to stop the small money laundering business, the laundering of drug trafficking, for instance. But they do not stop the real money laundering. Uh, uh, HSBC, for instance, has laundered Assad's money. This has not been an accident. This is a decision. And these are decisions taken because uh, uh, it is very profitable, probably. When I started working in, in the European Parliament, I headed the uh, Development Committee and we did put anti-corruption and anti-money laundering in the development agenda. And uh, I already wanted to have protection for whistleblowers. In the second term, in 2014, uh, I had a conference on whistleblowers and I invited the commission to be with us, and they were asked, are you going to put forward a directive on protection of whistleblowers? The answer was no, very clearly. We do not want, we, um, the argument was that we are not competent. It is not within the European competence to have a directive on protection of whistleblowers. What was important for the Commission then was to have a new directive on protection of business secrecy. And that directive did go through rather quickly, making it even more difficult for whistleblowers to tell what they know because they will be charged with violation of protection of business secrecies. And as you know, the European Commission is headed by Jean-Claude Juncker. He used to be the Prime Minister for decades in Luxembourg, and before that he was the Finance Minister. He was appointed, or he was nominated, the first day in November 2014. And uh, a few days later, a whistleblower called Antoine Deltour published with uh, a journalist the uh, 330 tax rulings that he had copied from PricewaterhouseCoopers um, Banque de Données. And uh, they, were, they went public. And here we saw that Luxembourg had granted tax rulings to multinationals on an industrial level, allowing them to pay nearly no taxes, 0.05, 0.01, sometimes two or three. And this was done by a whistleblower. So we can understand several things. It is that Juncker himself are not in favor of whistleblowers because they nearly costed him his Cost. The weakness of the European Parliament and the agreement between the two big political parties, 
the popular party, which your popular party is part of, and the socialist democrat make it impossible to impeach him because they wanted to protect Juncker because what the European politicians are much are most afraid of are the extremists that we also have that do not want Europe anymore. So uh, it was not possible in spite of what we saw but because how can you be the head of the European Union where the treaty says that the member states shall cooperate in a loyal manner when you have been stealing the tax income from your neighbors for decades. Luxembourg is, one of, is the richest country in the world per capita, even more wealthy than the Norwegians with all their oil. And this is unlegitimate. It is product of a tax fraud on a very industrial basis. But Luxembourg made one error. They started a prosecution against the whistleblower Antoine Deltour. He's a very young man. He was 29 at that time. He do believe in public interest. He believes in his action, that it was useful for the public interest to tell what Luxembourg is really about. And in his process, he had a huge public support and hundreds of thousands of Europeans were furious that the only person being prosecuted and convicted in Luxembourg was the whistleblower. Nothing happened to PricewaterhouseCoopers Librand who had done this work neither to the multinationals and the turnover of uh, <coughs> Coopers Librand Price Waterhouse went up, I think, 15% within that year. It was kind of publicity. Come to us and you will get rid of your taxes. And Juncker went along saying that everything is happening in Luxembourg is legal. But the world is changing. And today he don't say that anymore because he appeared in front of our special committee on Panama Papers two weeks ago, and he admitted that he regretted his past life. He said it was an other time, and that today he wouldn't do it anymore. Times, they are a changing and the hundreds of thousands of Europeans who signed up for Antoine del Tour made it impossible for Luxembourg to jail him, for instance. He was convicted to a fine and a suspended sentence, but this case made it totally clear that Europe does need a common whistleblower protection. And today, the European Commission is working on a project of whistleblower protection. They have promised us that within the end of the year, we will have a proposal. This proposal will then be dealt with, with um, within one or two of the committees in Parliament, and we will table amendments and try to make it a real good protection for whistleblowers that would then apply to Spain. Uh, what is important to me is that anonymity should be ensured and also that 
if by accident the anonymity is uh, reve revealed or the identity is revealed, uh, we need a fund to give uh, salaries, to give s uh, help to the persons. Because what we see from reality, be it in the US or in, in Spain or in France, is that the destiny of the whistleblower is very harsh, very hard. That I saw already when I was an investigative magistrate uh, in the infamous ELF case. The engineers within ELF who did withstand the request for corruption, they were harassed, they were fired, they lost their income, and very often also the family life goes down because it is hard times to live. And uh, uh, the examples from France of uh, Madame Chibot, who revealed the UBS case, the tremendous tax fraud case depriving France of billions of euros, she lost her job and she is living on minimum social subsidies. And she used to earn very well her life. And this is kind of common destiny and this is really, we don't need so much more examples of how, uh, how important it is to protect the whistleblowers. And um, so Europe is working on it. That will be minimum standards, and f Spain will be free to improve the text and to give a better protection than what we will be able to come up with. Because what we experience is that this is also very double tongue temas. Um, we had a vote yesterday on uh, uh, country by country reporting for multinationals and the PPU, the popular party, managed to water it down to be insignificant. It's a progress but it's not good enough and this can also happen with the whistleblower protection. So you should keep your elected members of European Parliament accountable. You could start sending them mails saying that you don't understand why they didn't vote for the country by country reporting uh, yesterday and that you will hold them accountable for what they will vote on the whistleblower directive. Yes. Um, there is so many things I want to, to share with you. And, um, and first, maybe some words about the unbelievable, unbelievable arrogance and impunity in the banking sector, not only in Spain, but uh, in many countries. If I tell you, I can start before talking about the Bankia scandal. Um, the Royal Bank of Scotland in England. They got 45 billion euros of European money, taxpayers' money, in order to not fail in 2009 and the period following up. But you know what? There has been no inquiry into the responsibility of the head of this bank. Looks like this is quite normal. The only country in the world who has hold their bankers accountable, put them into jail, confiscated their assets, is Iceland. A small country, tiny country of 300,000 inhabitants. 
They did have no prosecutor with the economic crime experience. They nominated an Icelander whose only experience was uh, a rape case and um, some Saturday night fights. But he were able with his team to indict and got convicted the head of the three Icelandic banks. Why didn't this happen in England or in the US or in Spain? There are answers that is that the interlinks between the political sphere and the banks are too intensive and it is probably very difficult for them to do. But getting back to Royal Bank of Scotland, in the Panama Papers, you see that they are one of the most active in helping rich British people not paying taxes. They have opened a lot of uh, offshore companies for their, their rich clients. I really, I'm really shocked about this two things. I need taxpayers' money in order to not die, but I'm helping British taxpayers not to pay taxes. And that is not all. The arrogance has no limit, absolutely no limit. The new requirements from Europe after the banking crisis of higher funds own funds for banks, the new BAL rules. They couldn't comply. And they had secret meetings about what can we do in order to improve our uh, proper funds. And they decided to steal their business clients' assets. And here is how they did it. These are small business, small businesses that do not have problems, but that has credit lines within this bank. The small businesses has offered guarantees for these credit lines. And these guarantees were very often their own, own houses. And then they decided, because of the crisis, that the value of the house that were given in guarantee was not good enough and must be increased or the credit line reduced. And they set up a special uh, unit to help their clients realize their assets. And then they were on the other side of the table and they did buy it on fire brand, or you say, on fire, on the, to very low prices. And this concerned thousands of clients. I don't, I haven't seen, but maybe I haven't seen it, maybe that has happened. And I'm wondering what the prosecutors waiting for in order to prosecute them for this disloyalty. I started with this example because I don't want to talk only about the Spanish banks, but um, the story of Bankia is really a very dirty story too. They didn't use the same technique as Royal Bank of Scotland, but by selling what they called the uh, preferential participations to old clients, to ordinary people uh, who lost uh, all their savings, uh, they obtained the same result. And here also you can wonder how is it that a bank who received 22 billion euros in public support 
and who was very operational in the fact that Spain got 40 billions from Europe for their banking sector. How is it that no inquiry was started when you saw that uh, after the introduction on the stock exchange, the value of the shares um, lost 50% uh, in some weeks or days and that you had to wait for my personal heroine, Simona Levy, who decided that this was not normal. But it was not the prosecutors who decided it. It was not the surveillance authorities of the banks. It was not the um, Conseil d'administration. It was a tango dancerine who said to herself and to her friends, I'm sure that Rodrigo Rotto is a criminal and I want to prove it. And she managed, but I will not take the word away from her because she's here and I'm very happy to meet with her today. But setting up, taking the consequences of the fact that the arrogance of um, the majors here in the suburb of Madrid prosecute or uh, filing suits against uh, people who had revealed uh, corruption scandals. She took the consequences to protect people, setting up her anonymous platform, allowing people who know about the wrongdoing of Rodrigo Rato to tell it. And she were able to give these proofs to somebody in whom she had confidence within the system, but she will tell us about that herself. But what is very, very interesting is to see that it is a citizen. It is not the institution. And this is terrible for Spain and shows how ill this country is and how urgent it is to take care of its citizens and of its uh, the interest of the general public and um, well but we learned a little later actually less than two months ago that the head of the anti-corruption unit in Madrid who name and shame is Manuel Mox who was protected by your government, probably, in the Leso scandal. This is really a state scandal, and I hope that it will be dealt with. But this, other speakers will tell us about. But with these burning cases on the table, you cannot talk about prevention of corruption. You can only talk about the necessity of repression, of investigations, investigations to be conducted on the evidence that are there. Because if these people will not be held accountable, if they will not be sentenced to, or sent to court and sentenced, I hope, to uh, severe uh, penalties because they were happy children, they had good parents, they are well educated, they, they are knowing what they are doing. And they should really be sentenced to years of imprisonment. So, I think you, um, your whistleblowers, um, some of them are still in huge problems, and I'm thinking of Anna Garida, Anna Garido. I don't know which she was invited today, um, but I think it's urgent not only to cry on the sad destiny of whistleblowers, but to do something about it, to offer her a job and get her back in work again. 
So, yes, the situation here is probably worse than in most other European countries, but you have also very good people. You have very dedicated magistrates, and uh, you are able, uh, we saw it in the host, uh, host search in the case of Ignacio Gonzalez, uh, where Manuel Mox wanted to, to stop it or try not to have it happen, that uh, the other prosecutors that were there were able to do it. So you have good people, and uh, we have an anti-corruption office here in Catalonia that uh, want to, to achieve uh, things, and I think that is uh, what uh, the public is expecting. I can tell you maybe a little bit now about uh, um, what Europe wants to do to improve the fight against corruption. There is one very important reform um, that has recently been achieved and that is the creation of a new European institution. That is the first good news for years within Europe, and that is the institution of the European prosecutor. We have had an agreement last month on the basis of a reinforced cooperation, enhanced cooperation, it is not all the European countries, but 20 of them. And Spain is in. And the idea is that the European prosecutor will be competent for a violation of the European uh, Union's economic interest. But that means also corruption in all the subsidiaries that the European Union is giving, you know, to olive oil production or uh, all the other, also for the structural funds. Uh, and the, uh, in the agreement, the competence is limited by a directive that we call the PIF directive. Uh, that is also quite recently achieved after uh, seven years of work. Uh, it also comprises the um, TVA, that is uh, the added value tax fraud, which is very important within the European Union. We are talking about uh, billions and billions uh, the European prosecutor will only be competent if the trans-border fraud is more than 10 million euros. And here is how it will function. Every one of the 20 member states that has joined will appoint one prosecutor to Europe. These prosecutors will form a big chamber and then they will be divided into smaller groups of three prosecutors. And uh, the chamber who has the Spanish prosecutor will be competent for Spanish inquiries. Uh, the member state will also appoint one or several delegated prosecutors in the country delegated European prosecutors. So probably in Madrid you will have one man with a double hat who will be the correspondent for the European prosecutor. I want to highlight how important this reform is. This is the first time that we will have an inquiry uh, and prosecution authority that is supranational. This institution will be able to conduct simultaneously inquiries 
in all these 20 member states. With a simple telephone call, you do not need mutual legal assistance requirement anymore as long as we are within uh, the competence of the uh, European prosecutor. Um, and when the inquiry is finished, the case will be taken to court due to the local rules. So a Spanish case will be taken to Barcelona or to Madrid or an, any other place and will be prosecuted by the European team. And this has the very good effect of putting a huge distance between the political negative forces that want to influence the inquiry and the inquiry. So that is to me the good news. Uh, it has been decided that the decisions taken by the European prosecutor, arrest order, confiscation and all this, are recognized all over Europe, also by the countries who didn't, who didn't want to be a member. Uh, for instance, the Netherlands, Sweden, Finland, Poland, Hungary are not part of the system, but they are welcome to join in later. Um, yes, so this, this was some of the ideas of the, of the events I wanted to share with you, and maybe to use also some minutes on what can be done uh, when you are faced with corruption that has infiltrated the institutions that are nearly everywhere, how, how can you get rid of it? And um, this, the international community, we have been struggling with this question for decades and there is no quick fix. Uh, in Kenya, for instance, I remember in the beginning of the 90s, they uh, fired uh, at the Supreme Court the most corrupt judges, but the replacement was not much better. It was ethnical uh, different. Um, a lot of systems have been uh, tried. I have also been working in Afghanistan for three years in Kabul, and there I discovered the unbelievable level of corruption. It is not that five, 10, 15 percent was taken away from the project. It was much more up to 90, I think, and uh, it was diverted from the project, from people, from development, into flats in Dubai for um, powerful Afghans, but not only, also foreigners. And how do you manage, how do you try to change things when I have a kind of idea I want to share with you. Corruption is a little bit like vampirism. When people have tasted the benefit of corruption, there is very little to do. In Afghanistan, a prosecutor, he earns $100 a month. We, the international community, we have spent hundreds of millions on training them, especially the Americans train them. And we increased the salaries up to 300, I thought it was, a month. But what they did, they took business people that they trailed without much reasons, confusing business disputes with criminal disputes, and then they were blackmailed 
and the price to get out of the prison was $50,000. So you see, how can you compete with these very high amounts and even increased salaries? You need new people. You need people who are educated. It is from the education level. It is from the school. It is from society. It is from the awareness in the society that we do not want this functioning. Because once it, is, it has happened, it is too late. And in Afghanistan, along with um, an institution I worked for called the MEC, Mutual Evaluation Committee, Joint Anti-Corruption Mutual uh, Anti-Corruption Committee. Its uh, website is mecmoc.rf. It is worth, worthwhile looking at because even in this totally corrupt country, we were able to to make the diagnostic, to conduct inquiries, to name and shame, and to construct what we call islands of integrity. When the system is totally corrupt, you cannot reform it from inside. It is nearly impossible. You must then have new ways. You must have uh, new people making the inquiries. You must have special chambers in the courts. And the special chambers must be there from on all the levels up to the high court. So the idea of islands of integrity and also the using prevention, having companies, having all the ministries building up their own anti-corruption program and monitor how this anti-corruption program is put into force. But you need a monitoring system unless it only becomes words and people are very good on setting up plans and programs. But that don't change the world, you need to implement it. But this was the way we thought in, um, in this totally corrupt country, and we were able to move a little forward on some important subject, and you can read about it on this internet page. I think I will stop here. Um, and uh, I am prepared to answer your questions if there are any. Thank you. Ens queda sis minuts, però que podríem allargar una mica més per les preguntes que es vulgui fer a la ponent. Bonjour Madame Jolie, ravie de vous entendre personnellement. Je vais poser ma question en catalan pour la traduction. Euh, je ne vous vois pas euh, oh, là-bas, là d'accord. Je suis là, oui. voilà. Oui. Donc euh, je, je vais vous poser la question en catalan euh, pour la traduction. Euh, As mentat différents casos de l'Arta 2 à France, comme le d'Antoine Del Tour par le cas LuxLeaks, eh, volia parlar-li i de Stephanie Gibó, evidentment per al cas UBS, que la traducció em sembla que UBS el banc de la Unió de Bancs Suïssos. Mm. Stephanie Gibó, en tot cas per ampliar una miqueta, va denunciar Bancs Suïssos, era la cap de relacions públiques, però denunciava un sistema, un sistema que UBS pot practicar aquí també, perquè el que ella denunciava era com era era una cosa sistèmica. Li volia preguntar sobre el tema dels mitjans de comunicació. Vostè ha parlat del cas d'Antoine Deltour, 
però amb Antoine Deltour va ser processat també el periodista que havia tret a la llum el cas LuxLeaks, Eduard Perrin, que treballava per una productora que estava fent un reportatge de fet per la televisió pública francesa. Això d'una banda, doncs voldria saber com, i després ha parlat dels Panama Papers, que també va sortir gràcies al Consorci de Periodistes d'Investigació. Voldria saber una miqueta quina és la seva opinió sobre els mitjans de comunicació, les febleses també dels mitjans de comunicació i les dificultats que a vegades hi ha per parlar de la corrupció. I segona pregunta, quan ha parlat també, ha parlat de l'Arta 2, hi ha hagut un cas a França que ha provocat també molta polèmica i vostè no l'ha esmentat, però que és el cas de tot el que va sortir a partir del banc HSBC-HSBC, i la llista Falciani. Falciani, hi ha hagut polèmica sobre el perfil, el rol que havia jugat. Per vostè és un alertador de la corrupció? Moltes gràcies. Equivoco, madam. Thank you for your questions. I talked about Stephanie Gibault. She has... Uh, suffered the, the normal destiny of a whistleblower whose identity is known. And, uh, I mean, she used to have a salary of several thousand euros and uh, she has difficulty surviving, in spite of the fact that due to her and other people, the, the French state were able to recover some three billion euros. And, uh, I saw a very shocking TV program with her and the Minister of Finance then, uh, Mr. Sapin. Uh, and uh, the um, lack of will to help was very evident. Uh, why, uh, why couldn't he uh, open a competition uh, where she would uh, be able to be recruited to have a job. Um, and uh, you know, you only accept the situation saying it's very sad to be a whistleblower and I cannot do, not, not do anything about it. So, I mean, her destiny and uh, Antonia, Antoni, uh, Antoine Deltour is a little different because the public opinion had changed, and for Antoine Deltour, I think he had a very good communication, and he had a huge public support, and he had a public job in France that he didn't lose. So his life was not really changed. But, and also, he, he was credited by his action. He got the prize of the European of the Year, uh, and uh, he was um, uh, greeted by uh, the committee on LuxLeaks uh, as uh, really a hero that had made progress in tax matters uh, happen in Europe much more quickly. So he has got honor. Um, the, med the weakness of the media, that is a general problem. It's the status of the media. It is the fact that they they are owned by uh, powerful industrialists and that it is not possible for most of these uh, uh, newspapers to tell stories about their owners. But we also have in France independent media, really. I'm talk thinking about two of them, Le Canard Enchaîné, who has no publicity. It's a very old newspaper, ironic one, who's publishing uh, regularly scandals, and the last one was about the presidential candidate uh, Fillon. They revealed how he had employed his wife for decades for very high salaries. And, and the public opinion has changed because this was tolerated. A man like Balkany, the mayor of Puteau, he has been able to go around with uh, uh, everybody knows how much money he has stolen, but he's still the mayor. And, but the public opinion has changed. I think this will not be possible anymore. For HSBC, uh, I think what is lacking, they, 
they will be, uh, no, UBS will be prosecuted in France. Uh, HSBC probably also through uh, uh, the Falsini case. I do not care about his personal interest. What is important is the information that he gave and is the fact that this information can be acted on. And um, in France, we have a rule saying that in criminal matters, you can use proofs, proofs even if they are stolen. When they are in the, the, when they are in the criminal proceedings, they can be used. It is different on the civil level that we saw uh, in, in another case where it was ruled that uh, illegal uh, enregistrement in the racial recording of Madame Betancourt's uh, proxy, proxy could not be used in civil purposes, but they can be used in criminal cases and the media are totally important. Uh, I talked about Canard Enchaîné, l'autre, very important in France, is Mediapart, which is a totally electronic uh, newspaper. Uh, and they are doing very thorough inquiries into corruption. And they, they have a high level of credibility. Regarding, hello. Yeah. Regarding the idea of false news, um, which you know the uh, the big search engines, for example, are starting to make steps uh, to investigate how true uh, false news is. Um, how true false news? How false How true? Well. Powerful. Um, yeah, the idea of false news, you know, especially under the new regime of Trump. Um, Not false news, he says. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think false news has been around a long time, especially with the darling Rato, you know, Rodrigo Rato, uh, when he was appointed uh, boss of the IMF. The BBC said that he pushed through market orientation reforms, privatizations, and stabilized the country's economy. Um, I'm sorry, I, I only got the, the first part of your question about false news, Trump, and then? Yeah, but I, I think this agenda is very important regarding you know, some of the cases we've been talking about this morning. Ratto, for example, was eulogized by the BBC, by Reuters, as having reformed the Spanish economy, whereas in fact the Spanish economy after Ratto was in a very poor state. Mm. Um, that is bad work, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, from your position as a, effectively a legislator trying to make changes within the EU, are there any moves afoot to actually punish or prosecute uh, media organisations who are obviously <coughs> propagandising for, um, for corrupt collaborators, for cronies you know, within the financial political system? Um, because in a sense, I think this is very important in that mm. you know, with social media, the general public are being hoodwinked very, very easily. You know, a tweet by, um, by the American president can have more effect than a year's publication by Le Canard Echané or El Triangle. Um, you know, what's the EU doing about that? Mm. Should we take some questions? Oh, I, I want to answer this. Well, um, it's a very serious question about uh, alternative facts and uh, uh, the fact that science is being discredited and that uh, rumors can take over. Um, there is an ongoing investigation in the US now as to Trump and the manipulation of the election uh, of the election campaign, and especially the role of the Russians. There is an ongoing inquiry into that. And I think we can credit the Americans uh, 
despite the fact that they have elected this crazy man, uh, that they have good institutions and that their special prosecutors will not give in. So um, that is an on ongoing uh, inquiry. You can never, you can never forbid that there are bad uh, work done also by journalists. And if they affirmed that uh, Ratto had uh, uh, done a good work for the Spanish economy, probably that was also because he was proposed to head the, the, the monetary fund. And uh, when you are proposed by your government and supported by a lot of other European countries, you are supposed to be competent. Huh? So I don't know whether that can be uh, prosecuted. But in all countries, you have what we call the le faux usage de faux. And the force that is a criminal offense, and it can be intellectually false. That is also an offense. So uh, we have the tools. But if you have to choose between a journalist who has given a credit to uh, Rato's economic action or uh, to uh, an inquiry surrounding stealing of, uh, of, um, of tens of millions of euros by criminal organizations benefiting a lot of uh, your elite, I think the choice is also easy. Última, última pregunta. Sí, moltes gràcies. Bon dia. Gràcies per la seva explicació. Uh, M'ha cridat l'atenció uh, la figura del fiscal europeu. Uh, vostè ha explicat que hi hauria un fiscal europeu i que tindria delegació als diferents estats membres, de moment, dintre d'aquests 20 fiscals, d'aquests 20 estats, perdó, que estan en, el, en la qüestió. La pregunta és... Tenint en compte que a l'estat espanyol la figura de la Fiscalia està en qüestió pel seu nomenament, perquè és un fiscal que el nomena el govern. Eh, també l'informe greco del grup d'estats anticorrupció qüestiona aquesta independència del fiscal general de l'estat, bàsicament com a conseqüència de qui és qui nomena. Que aquest fiscal general de l'estat que nomena el govern és qui nomena els fiscals en cap en llocs molt sensibles, com per exemple el fiscal anticorrupció, el senyor Moix, va ser nomenat pel fiscal general de l'Estat. Com podem garantir llavors la independència d'aquest fiscal europeu, que depèn del fiscal europeu, si és el mateix fiscal que ve nomenat pel fiscal general de l'Estat que nomena el govern? Hi ha un mecanisme de prevenció a nivell preveu aquesta figura del fiscal general, alguna forma de nomenaments dels fiscals en cap? Gràcies. The fact that the prosecutors are not independent is a democratic immaturity and something that you should take care of. This should change. This is also a problem in France and is something that has hampered the consideration and the action for years, for decades. Protected powerful people, also because uh, people want to progress in their career. You start at the level, we, we are about 7,000 judges in France, and there are only 300 and some positions on the top. And these are, many of them are political positions. And that do create kind of behavior that you need to please, to progress, and this is very damageable. And the public opinion has changed. This is not tolerated anymore. And our new president has promised to give the same status to prosecutors as to judges. They cannot be removed anymore against their wish, and they will be appointed by the Conseil Supérieur de la Magistrature, or we are all appointed, all the judges, by the government, but it is on proposal of an independent institution. Up till now, there was an exception for the general prosecutor, 
and for prosecutors. But this, of a new president, has promised to change, and we can do it now because the majority in the parliament is more than two-thirds what is needed to get this reform through. And I think I have been saying for 30 years that the French system was on this, from this point of view, exactly the expression I use, uh, democratic immaturity. Clearly, the power, be it social democrat or conservative, wanted to have, high, uh, have their hands on the prosecution. Very often, the prosecution in Paris was the former head of cabinet of, uh, uh, of a minister, minister of justice, or the president. So they were closely linked. This will change now. And I think you should take, um, you should use those terrible cases that are on the table now to obtain from your weakened government that this being changed. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, señora Jolie. Eh, ahora hacemos una pausa en la nuestra jornada de 30 minutos y comenzaremos seguidamente con la intervención, con la ponencia del señor Paul Stevenson. Gracias.